Good morning, everybody. I'm Michael David Fox. I am the director of the Center of Eurasian Russian East European Studies here in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Jill Doherty, who um, runs our Russia brief, and also to say that our sponsor for Russia brief is the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, Jill Doherty is an adjunct professor here at Ceres, and she is formerly with CNN, both as White House correspondent, as State Department correspondent, and as Moscow Bureau Chief. I'm especially looking forward to this session with Ambassador John Teft because Georgia really is at a crossroads and also because Jill Doherty was just in Georgia very recently. So Jill, it's all yours. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Really, I'm, I'm so glad uh, that people are uh, joining the Zoom call because I agree. I mean, Georgia is really important. It's a very complicated place and we have a perfect guest to talk about it. Um, as Michael mentioned, you know, if you remember, if you're a faithful viewer, uh, our last uh, Russia brief I moderated from Tbilisi, Georgia. We were talking about the Russian presidential election, but I wanted, when I got back and my thoughts were kind of together, I wanted to do a session on uh, Georgia and its future. And you know, when, when I was in Tbilisi, I spoke with a lot of officials from political parties, uh, United National Movement, LELO, uh, there was a new party that's called The New Party that was created literally as I arrived. And then I walked around Tbilisi a lot and I saw a ton of uh, graffiti all over buildings everywhere all of it virulently anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, pro-NATO, pro-EU. It was very interesting. And then finally, I went to the occupation line where, um, you know, the I stared down at a military base that the Russians have there. And uh, it's just one of many that are being deployed in two areas illegal, illegally occupied by Russia, and that's South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So a lot to talk about. Georgia is a small country, population 4 million people, but it's very complex. And to help us understand it, we have a really fantastic guest, John Teft. He is a former U.S. ambassador to Georgia and also former ambassador to uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Lithuania. So he knows the region very well and an extremely uh, experienced and skilled diplomat. So uh, Ambassador Teft, really glad to have you here. Morning, Jill. Happy to be with you. Great. Well, we're going to get going. Uh, we'll start out with about a half an hour of discussion between Ambassador Teft and me, and then we'll open it up to questions. And you can put those in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. So... <clears throat> um, I think what I'd like to start uh, with is this news that just came out a few days ago that the foreign agents law, which is essentially um, a Russia uh, inspired law, draft law, that was that was raised last year and then revoked. It went away because if you remember, there were a lot of protests in Tbilisi. The woman who was water cannoned in the streets holding an EU flag, well, that law is back again. And it's the exact same law with a slightly different tweak. So I want to find out, Ambassador Teft, why do you think it's back? Why would the government decide, or the Georgian Dream Party, which is the ruling party, why would they decide to bring back something that it would appear the Georgian people don't want? Well, I think the, the answer, Jill, is it's politics. Uh, Georgia is facing, as you know, uh, new parliamentary elections in October. And I think the people in Bidzina Ivanishvili's Georgia Dream Movement have decided that somehow this is going to help them uh frankly i mean i haven't been there as recently obviously as you have but it's hard to figure out how the calculation goes there because this is against the the principles that the eu has set out uh last uh 
November when when they invited when they said that Georgia would be a candidate member for, to join the EU, it's now drawn criticism from European Union, from European nations, from the United States, from civil society groups in Georgia, all over the world. And, and so you, the question is, are they are they bruising for another confrontation on the streets? Uh, this, is somebody calculating that that will help them in the election? Uh, it's hard for me to kind of judge that. I, I read some of the statements that have been made by the Georgian uh, government, the Georgian Dream officials, and, uh, you know, they try to make this sound like it's just, well, it's like the American uh, foreign agents registration law, which it isn't. It's very, very different from that. Uh, or that this is somehow all about transparency and that this should be something the EU wants. Well, it isn't going to wash. It isn't going to wash uh, with the EU. It's not going to wash with those who are friends of Georgia. And most of all, I don't think it's going to wash with the Georgian people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, I think there have been a couple of demonstrations already uh, mm. against this new incarnation. You know, speaking of that, when I was in Tbilisi, I would ask people, how does this work? You know, the Georgian team, the government, um, rhetorically support joining the EU, rhetorically support, you know, moving west, et cetera. But in action, and this is a perfect example, they do sometimes the complete opposite. And so I said, "What can you explain what this balancing act is? And several people, albeit in the opposition, kind of slapped my hands and said, uh, no, it's not a balancing act. They are on the side of Russia. So can you set us straight? Do you think that uh, you know, the government, the Jordan Dream, actually is pro-Russian? Or what exactly is going on? Well, I mean, you can use a lot of words to describe the balancing act or a schizophrenic uh, policy. Uh, you know, I've talked to some of my George, some of my American friends who have recently been to Georgia, and they can't figure out for the life of themselves what the strategy is here. You know, we've been dealing with this now for a couple of years. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was did an interview with Georgian television. And it was right after the Georgian dream says they want to be a part of the EU. And then they blasted the EU and the and the American ambassadors. And I tried to defend them and, and try to say, what do you think you're accomplishing here? Who, who is this going to help? Because Georgia is the supplicant here. They want to be in the in the EU or maybe, you know, cynically, some of the people in the government don't. But the fact is, you've got, uh, I don't know what the latest polls are, but consistently over the last few years, 80 to 90 percent of the people of Georgia say they want to be a part of the EU. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of the time when I was in Ukraine before, right before the uh, Revolution of Dignity. And you'll remember at that time, the, the Revolution of Dignity was, was triggered, in effect, by the decision of Yanukovych, uh, to basically not join the or to not move forward with an EU association agreement. And people there wanted to be a part of Europe. They want to travel to Europe. They want their kids to go to school in Europe. They want to have the European values. They want to have rule of law. And, you know, I guess the only thing we conclude can conclude right now is that the government of Georgia somehow sees the need for political control, or perhaps they see some other political motivation here that I don't get uh, to try to move ahead with this crazy law, which looks very much like what the Russians have used to uh, stomp out civil society. I think civil society is absolutely critical. And I think what we've, what the United States and Europe did to help civil society develop in both Georgia and Ukraine is one of the great things that we've done in our foreign policy in the last few years. So I don't know, it's hard to come to any other conclusion than there's some political motivation here to undercut uh, you know, support for uh, civil society. And perhaps somebody sees that this is the key to winning the elections come uh, October. I'm just not sure that that's the case though. Yeah. Can I you know sort of follow up, uh, sure. Jill, on this question? Because I read in a couple of places, including The Economist, the notion that, um, the calculation of the government in, in, it was that 
your EU has already signaled that it wants Georgia and that its tolerance for democratic backsliding is significant, that they're calculating that this will sort of be accepted by the EU, right? Uh, that was the notion, um, you know, so what do you think about that? Well, you know, we've I've seen over the last uh, year or so in the previous prime minister, who's uh, now moved on to be the head of the Georgia Dream political party. Uh, uh, he's a big fan of, uh, of Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. And, you know, he I, he they like it that Viktor Orban kind of sticks his finger in the eye of the EU over and over again. But there's a big difference between Georgia and Hungary. Hungary's in the EU. Georgia wants to get into the EU. They want the money. They want, uh, you know, they want to take it, but they don't want to accept the, the conditions. And, you know, going back to even my time in Lithuania back in the early 2000s when they were trying to get into the EU, you know, th the way you do it is you have to meet the requirements of the EU acquis communitaire. You've got to pattern your institutions. You've got to, to make sure that the values are there um, and that you honor those things, rule of law, civil society. And yet somehow the, the guys who are running Georgia seem to think that that they can they don't have to do that. Uh, you know, I read over again this morning as I was preparing for our discussion today, the nine rules that the EU, the nine principles that they put out last November when they agreed to let uh, Georgia become a candidate member, not to start negotiating the acquis communitaire, which they gave to Ukraine and to Moldova, but to be a candidate member. And, you know, a number of the things that are going on there just fly fully in the face of these nine principles. How do they expect to, to be able to, to, to do that? Maybe they think that somehow this is the way to do it. And, and again, people in Georgia are going to like it that they stand up, but they're not going to get into the EU then. And yeah. I think the, the people are, are, you know, the government's fooling themselves. Now, again, may, as I said to Jill earlier, maybe this is all cynicism, that this is somehow a, a, a deep game to try to somehow say, well, we're in favor of it, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to do the things that are required by the EU. And I saw one editorial the other day that said, you got you can't just talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. And I think that's the challenge before the government right now, because I think the people of Georgia, as I understand it, and from what Jill has said about her recent visit, these people want to, to walk that walk. They want to be a part of the EU. Yeah. Well, I mean, as we all know, if you join the EU, as you were just pointing out, Ambassador Taft, you have to play by the rules. And the rules mean that some of the old ways of doing things, especially economically, can't continue. And so there are very strong economic uh, interests in Georgia that want it the old way. And the old way uh, was connected to Russia and to a certain extent still is. Um, you know, I was thinking maybe um, I'd love to talk about uh, Bidzina Ivanishvili, who is a very interesting character. Um, maybe we could spend five minutes. There's a lot to talk about. But this is, I'm sure that everybody in the audience has heard of him. Uh, he is the richest man. He's a gazillionaire. He's a billionaire, um, multi-billionaire. And he's the former prime minister. Uh, and yet, technically, he has no job with the government, and yet he's considered kind of the eminence grise, you know, the um, uh, power behind the throne in Georgia. Um, Ambassador Tuff, could you just give us a, a quick thumbnail? I mean, what what does he do <laughs> for a living? <laughs> you know, Jill, when I was ambassador in Georgia from 2005 to 2009, uh, I tried a number of times, asked for meetings with uh, Ivanishvili, and he never gave me a meeting. I've never met the man personally. Uh, the only ambassador he would meet in that period was the French ambassador. And as my French colleague used to tell me, the main reason was he, he, he would talk about either his property, his estate in southern France, or about his child going to the French school in, uh, in Tbilisi. Um, the man is a, I would say, Soviet-era oligarch, and I use the term Soviet as opposed to Russian <laughs> quite clearly. He made his fortune there and uh, has a lot of the uh, experiences and uh, in his life and in his business 
that come from that period. I know a lot of those people from my Russia experience. You do too. Um, but unlike uh, other Georgians who made a fortune during the early 90s in Russia, uh, Kaha ben Dukidze, the late Kaha ben Dukidze, for example, who was a great liberal and was really one of the great movers of reform in Georgia back in the 2005 to 7 period when I was there. Uh, Ivanishvili shares many of the more conservative uh, traits, I would say, uh, of a uh, of a Soviet oligarch, put it that way. Mm. Now he he even when I was there, he 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 was building up enormous amounts of money. I mean, there I had a friend of mine tell me last year that Ivanishvili owns half the country. Now I have no idea because I you can't tabulate that probably, but you know the man's enormously wealthy. For my time in Georgia, he basically worked with President Misha Saakashvili, but uh, they came to a point where he decided that he he wasn't going to do that, and he decided he founded the Georgian Dream Party and he ran, and they defeated Saakashvili. Saakashvili, for all of whatever people may think of him, basically did what good democratic politicians do. He said, "We lost, so we'll move on," and that then began the effort to try to. Uh, then became began the effort to try to tarnish Saakashvili, which resulted in his going to prison. And uh, I think most of the people know what's happened. But I think Ivanishvili is was a long time kind of recluse. Uh, he's met some Americans. He's refused to meet American officials when they come. Um, he still has connections to Russia. I don't know the details of all of those right now, but you hear all kinds of rumors about it. Um, as you mentioned in, in the start, Jill, there's people who think that the, the Georgia and the Georgian dream government is tilting more toward Russia than it is toward the EU right now. And you can read a lot of analyses that show that, in fact, uh, the ties with Russia are there. They had a deal to restore airplane flights, to let Georgian uh, uh, Georgians go to Russia uh, without a visa. Uh, but there's also lots of Russian money coming into the society. And you know, we can go through a lot of different things that uh, have resulted in Russia getting a stronger say. Um, anyway, maybe I'll stop at that point. Uh, you can go on. This is a fascinating man about whom less is sometimes known than more because he's, he, he tries to keep himself in a, in a recluse. He's got a big house that you saw it uh, above Tbilisi on the hillside with uh, an art collection, which is unparalleled in Georgia. But all of the paintings in there are all copies of the originals that he has, which he keeps in London, at least as I understand it. Anyway, it's... Yeah, it <laughs> Lots of little anecdotes about the man, but uh, no, it's fascinating. Yeah. And just a quick thing on Russia. Um, I don't know that we have to discuss it that much, but we do know that there were, um, well, probably close to 300,000 Russians, 250. It's hard to get the numbers on this, but let's say between 200 and 300,000 Russians who fled after the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 and came at least to, to Tbilisi or through Tbilisi uh, and then went on sometimes to other capitals of the world. But it has made a very big uh, difference. I can tell you, um, I did hear a lot of Russian on the streets. There were people who I am quite sure were Russian. Um, I didn't actually talk with any Russians that I know of, but they're, uh, they're a big factor there is a bit of animosity because when they came to the city, uh, rental prices and real estate went sky high, and now they are leaving. So I understand about half, maybe uh, John Ambassador, mm -hmm. you know, about half of them have moved on, but they're a factor. And there was a lot of, I think those, um, uh, the graffiti was sparked in part right. by just having the, that mm, element, let's say, in Tbilisi. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's what I've heard as well. Uh, the other thing is that over the last uh, 10 years, I mean, even when I was there, there were Russians coming in. This is right when Russia was attacking Georgia, who were investing in vineyards in some of the wine producing areas. And it, the, the money that they brought in actually was useful in a sense that they helped Georgia develop 
varietals uh, that they could then sell in Europe that were very much, uh, Georgia always has had good soil and good wine and good grapes, but they had some, they brought in technical people who could uh, kind of raise the notch of uh, quality uh, in Georgia. And there was lots of investment money then. And there were people who were worried back even then. And now, as you described, you've got lots more people coming in. And I think, as you say, the graffiti and some of the opposition to the Russians uh, taking over apartments in certain parts, nice parts of the center of the city of Tbilisi, uh, raised a lot of anxiety. I'm not surprised that people will leave. I've left. I was in, I might just say I was in uh, Lithuania last uh, September, and there's not that many, but there's a lot of uh, Russians who still live there. Of course, the situation is completely different because the the Lithuanians welcomed them with open arms, and many of the people of Navalny's organization and others live now in Lithuania, um, which has angered the, the Kremlin, as you could imagine. But uh, even there, I, on the street uh, or in restaurants, uh, I'd be sitting there and you, know, <laughs> you could hear the Russian coming back. It was Russian, and because and, most Lithuanians, a lot don't even know uh, Russian, but many... Uh, uh, especially younger people, but uh, you didn't hear it certainly as much on previous visits that I'd made there when I served in Lithuania back at the beginning of the century. Yeah, it's a big element. Um, I'd like to talk about another country that has influence, and that's China. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going to a security conference about eight years ago, and they put us up in a hotel that I'd never seen before, brand new, and lo and behold, it was Chinese. It was a big cavernous, you know, um, actually very nice hotel, uh, fantastic gym, I think one of the nicest gyms <laughs> I've ever seen, and uh, which leads me to China. So right now we have China uh, building a billion dollar highway um, east and west uh, throughout through the Georgian mountains. Um, Ambassador Tapt, are you uh, worried, concerned um, about the Chinese influence or could it be something good for Georgia? Um, I think it could be good, but it depends on how the Chinese want to use their influence. You know, I have a, my son-in-law, uh, Paul Stronsky, is an expert on Central Asia and the Chinese and Russian uh, competition there. And there's a lot of those countries that are now getting tired and getting worried about the the Chinese and of course their Belt and Road initiative where they give these they build these projects and then countries for example in Africa get stuck with these enormous loans that they have to pay off is is rousing uh, uh, a lot of uh, kind of anxiety anger whatever uh the previous prime minister in Georgia Mr. Garbashvili he worked for a Chinese company for 4 years before he became prime minister uh and there's clearly a lot uh uh, a lot of Chinese money going in there. It's obvious the reason why Georgia is in this crucial strategic position between the Black and the Caspian Seas. It's a, it's a, uh, a potential, uh, it, it is already a uh, area where uh, energy, gas, oil, as well as other materials are flowing to the West. Um, one of the first indicators that I had about the Georgian Dream government was the scuttling of a proposed uh, rebuilding of the port in a place called Anaklia uh, on the on the the Baltic I'm sorry the Black Sea side of Georgia there was a consortium which a number of Americans were very much interested in participating in and the the Vanishvili team scuttled it said we're not going to do this anymore and it this still hasn't been as far as I know completely brought back on track uh, and I think this is going to be important for the future. There's rumors that, you know, the Russians put pressure on Ishvanashvili, the Chinese put pressure on him to stop it. Uh, I think the Georgians are going to have to figure out what it is they want. And, you know, from my standpoint, they should be as transparent and open and build a, a system that's good for Georgia and not necessarily for, for somebody who can uh, foot part of the bill. They could have raised the money, I think, as I understand it, in Western business circles, because it's, uh, I think it's a, a, economically, it's a sound idea, but uh, they scuttled it, which, uh, as I said, was one of the first kind of red lights going off for me that uh, something was amiss. Mm -hmm. Yes, in fact, uh, that's a, a really good uh, issue. And I, I just want to remind the audience, 
Q&A function uh, questions. I'm sure our um, audience can come up with some great questions. So please put them in there and we'll go to Q&A in a second. Um, you know, the, I did want to talk a little bit about um, the port because it, it does, you know, when you look at the position of Georgia as the only South Cauc Caucasus country that has a Black Sea port, and the economics make utter sense, and it's a deep port, right? I mean, it's very, very deep. Yes. So it, it makes all sorts of sense. I have seen a few um, reports that there's more talking about reviving it, and several politicians that I talked to said they feel you know, it's going to happen, but the question is when and how. So it's it's really important. Does the United States officially have uh, a viewpoint on Anaclia or any policy? I think, I think, Jill, we supported it back uh, back when it came up. I mean, this idea of doing this port has been there for a long time. I mean, President Saakashvili and parliamentarians were talking about this when I was in Georgia in 2005. Because, as you say, it's a deep water port. It's the uh, it's the logical terminus for uh, railroad and uh, roads and other things, uh, and really could be a critical factor in Georgia's economic future, uh, which is why it's a tragedy that it hasn't really moved ahead at all. But I think the U.S. government was supportive of it. I mean, the, the U.S. government per se didn't try to get in the middle of it, but there were a number of prominent Americans companies and investors who were ready to, to join a consortium. Now, that consortium was being put together by uh, a fellow by the name of Mamuka Khazaradze, who is the head of the Tbilisi uh, Bank, the biggest bank in the country. And he is now the head of one of the, uh, uh, or is the chairman, I think, of one of the uh, uh, opposition parties, Lilo for Georgia. And uh, there may have been politics in this as well. But, uh, you know, countries... If they're caring about their economic future, they've got to make these tough decisions and, and move ahead uh, for their own country's interests, not uh, because they're playing some kind of geopolitical game. Mm. Speaking of geopolitical games, um, there was another issue that came up as I talked to these political leaders and members of parties. Um, I would say, well, you've got very important parliamentary elections coming up in October. And the opposition is hoping that they can at least get a coalition government and kind of dampen the uh, control of the Georgian dream team. And uh, they would say, yes, yes, uh, but it can't happen here in Georgia. And I would say, well, why? Well, they said, well, we just we just you know can't do that, but we'll work together. Um, well, I guess I would be, my question would be, why can't you work together? Or why not even create one big party where everybody, a big tent where people could come together? Now, I mean, we don't have to go into the specifics of each party, et cetera. But um, is, do you think, uh, I, I know you're not going to predict how the elections will turn out, but what are your thoughts about the election coming up? Do you think that the opposition can somehow get its act together and, uh, you know, convince people? So your, your question is one of the fundamental questions for modern Georgia. <laughs> it's it's the, the inability of the opposition to find common ground and build coalitions that you know, won't give everybody what they want, but it's a compromise and they can move the country in the direction they want. Um, over the years, friends of mine have come from Georgia and I've had a cup of coffee with them here in Washington. And this, I was, I haven't been there for a couple of years now, but, you know, I'd ask them, so why can't you sit down and make a deal, cut a deal? Okay, you won't get what you want. You won't get all of the things that are on your list. But isn't it more important to, for you to try to build a common opposition to, in this case, the Georgian dream. And there were people back when Saakashvili was in power who tried to, to do the same. And, you know, the opposition uh, would was unable to, to, to come together. A very senior Georgian politician told me many years ago that everybody in Georgia wants to be president and everyone thinks they can do better than the current incumbent. And I mean, there's a certain amount of truth to that. Uh, lots of politicians and lots of small parties bubble up and then they go away. Uh, it's, I guess, a mark of uh, of democracy 
and the development or the lack thereof in Central East Europe. I always just, an aside here, when I was in Lithuania, I was always amazed after they got their independence back. I arrived about uh, nine years after they would reclaimed independence, and they'd had a kind of turbulent time in the 1990s. But the fundamental point was that the two poles, the, the kind of center left and the center right, both had their leaders, both didn't like the other one. And yet for the country's interest, specifically getting into EU and NATO, they put aside the differences and put the country's interests ahead. And I think that's really a fundamental thing that you don't see in some of the other countries, uh, particularly those that didn't have, like the Baltics, a period of independence between the First and Second World Wars, where you had economic development, where you had some form of democracy coming ahead. Those who just knew only totalitarian communism, uh, you didn't have that development. So what we're going through now is, I think, a period where democracy is forming, breaking, consolidating. Again, it's it's one of those periods in history where they'll look back and say this was a, a critical period. I'd like to say that you know, the, they, the turning point is about to happen. I just don't know for sure that that's the case. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting some questions in the Q&A function. And okay. there, are, there are a few that are very interesting. There's There are two from Anj uh, Chikavadze. And um, Anj is asking, I think I'll take the second question from Anj because it's linked to the first. Uh, okay. So as the candidate status for the EU uh, gave the Georgian dream a domestic boost among its pro-European electorate. And now with the reintroduction of the bill, it's unlikely that the electorate will take to the streets in as large numbers as last year. So to me, that that point, I, I do, and I, I've been following that in conversations, that some people are saying, well, we may not love the Georgian dream, but they did get us uh, at least considered for uh, membership in the EU. So maybe we support, not necessarily support them, but give them a break. Don't go into the streets. Do you think, Ambassador Tuff, that that is, that's correct, that that decision, um, you know, by the EU to give them candidate status actually could be helping the Georgian dream? It's possible, but I mean, the EU, at least in my view, faced kind of a conundrum. Uh, last year when they had to come and make this decision. Uh, if you don't give, if you don't, uh, I mean, there was a distinction, as I mentioned before, between Ukraine and Moldova, which were allowed to go ahead and begin negotiations on the on the accession agreement, the acquis communitaire, to the EU, which is a long, drawn-out process, and Georgia, which was given kind of candidate status, but not yet allowed to negotiate. That was the distinction they made. The question is, if you had not given Georgia that, would that just have reinforced those in Georgia who wanted, didn't want the EU as a member? Now, I know from Georgians who are friends of mine who send me emails, there was actually jubilation in the sense that they thought that this was going to at least keep the possibility open. They had no illusions. They're not, some of these people were not uh, supporters of the Georgian dream, but they were afraid that if they, didn't get, have the possibility still held out there, even with the conditions that the EU put on it, that Georgia would miss the boat completely, and this would be a historical turning point because they want to be a part of the European Union. Uh, I think the EU came up with kind of a Solomonic decision here. They decided to keep the possibility open because they knew so many Georgian people, as opposed to the government, wanted to do that. Uh, there's a woman who was a very prominent Lithuanian member of the uh, European Parliament. Her name is Rasa Yuknevichenia. You may know her, Jill. She's uh, She was defense minister and was a good friend of mine when I was there. And she made it very clear that the decision uh, to do this was because they didn't, the EU didn't want to forsake the Georgian people and their dreams of being part of Europe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any kind of a... a a step to ameliorate the government. Now, how this gets actually played out, whether people go to the streets if they push this bill through, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you may have a better sense than I. But, uh, you know, I, I think you still have this fundamental 
collision here between a government which is half-hearted at best on, on getting into the EU and, and a vast majority of the people who want to be part of Europe. And, uh, and Europe wants to keep the, the, the prospect, uh, the dream of Europe whole, free, and at peace alive, despite the war in Ukraine, despite people, despite governments that have uh, backsliding as the, the current Georgian government has. Hard to hard to predict exactly what how this will pan out. At least for me, it is. Yeah, um, just a quick um, addition from um, Anj Chikabadze saying, was it a mistake for the EU to grant Georgia candidate status, considering Tbilisi did not meet any criteria? I'm not. I don't know whether that's correct, but that's what he's saying. Especially considering the upcoming general elections. And it also aided the strategic ambiguity the Georgian dream has pursued. So uh, is, is it a mistake or was it a mistake? For I, I don't think it was a mistake. I, I, uh, I think people in Brussels, and you know, I remember reading the statement by uh, uh, von der Leyen, the commissioner of the EU. Again, it made the same point that we felt an obligation to the people of Georgia to keep this dream alive. And if they hadn't done that, how would what would they have said? Uh, governments do come and go. The people stay. And I think the ultimate calculus was to keep the dream going. And I, I would be the last person to try to second guess that. Yeah. Can I ask from a different sure. perspective here on this point? Because this is more of a conceptual question, but I know you've thought about it because you alluded it to it earlier, the parallels between Ukraine and Georgia, when I look at the political situation here, you know, I see a lot of parallels, the on again, off again reform, the two poles or magnets of Russia and the EU. And then, you know, the, the in Ukraine, you have the orange revolution, then you have the revolution of dignity. So this would be for Georgia roughly about 2014, if we're drawing that parallel. I'm just interested in your thoughts on the if you stand back, right, the issues, the fundamental choice and push and pull are, are still the same. So, yeah. Well, I think the, you know, there's always been debate in Europe and, of course, in the United States uh, with regard to NATO about whether you want to make these, uh, make the decisions to bring the Ukraine and Georgia, uh, Moldova into uh, Western institutions. And as you know, Michael, the, the the driving dream here has been to make, as I said before, Europe whole, free, and at peace. And the European project, for want of a better term, is what is what has animated this from the very beginning. There are people who oppose that, who think uh, we need a more realpolitik view. This is Russia's area of the world. We shouldn't kind of intervene. Uh, but I'll just tell you a story. When I was in Georgia, one of the things that I really got engaged in on, on the side for, for my own in entertainment, enjoyment, edification, was looking going to archaeological sites and seeing the roots of Western civilization in Georgia, from Greek colonies to Roman colonies, you know, all the way through history. The, the, the Georgians have been at the far end, perhaps, but they have been a part of Europe and European history. And, uh, you know, I think what we have today is the desire of so many people, especially young people in that society, who, who want to continue that. They want to be a part of Europe. Now, Putin, with his own view of Russia's imperial, you know, restoring Russia's imperial uh, uh, sway in that part of the world, he doesn't even want to think about this. But it's he wants to oppose it. And that's why Jill mentioned before, when you go to the border or to the line of con uh, the line of conflict between South Ossetia and the rest of Georgia, it's now ringed by these military intelligence bases uh, to protect uh, the Russian control, the troops that are there. And Abkhazia, there, I read a piece this morning. the The Russian grip is closing ever more on Abkhazia. Uh, when I was there, I used to go to Abkhazia, and American ambassadors could still do it. And those people in their quiet moments would take me for a walk in the street and say, you know, we've got to survive this. We, we Abkhaz want to be a part of Georgia. We don't like Saakashvili. We don't like some of the things that go on there, but it's far better than the other alternative, which was the tie to Russia. 
So, you know, I think there is a future there. I obviously, when I was ambassador, worked uh, to carry out the policies of the Bush administration, which was to try to bring them into NATO and the European Union the same. But the, some of the people are still out there and the war in Ukraine, I think, has encouraged some of those people. Mm. You know, speaking of um, those bases, I'll just say this quickly because there's another question. But when I was um, talking to the security person, a Georgian security person, who explained how it works, you know, what the base looks like, et cetera. Um, I said, why doesn't Russia, you know, just simply annex both of them, a la Ukraine? Why don't they just take them over? Because they militarily, they probably could, you know, the Georgians could not fight against that. And he said, essentially, the Russians like to keep them in this kind of gray area so that they can turn up the heat diplomatically, militarily, and other, you know, societally, and then turn it down. That not solving the problem of those of uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia actually is in the Russian interest because they can use it as leverage to destabilize the society. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting because you see the same, same playbook in many different places that Russia is involved in. Yeah, I agree with that. It's uh, I, I've been known to refer to the uh, to Abkhazia, Ossetia, uh, Transnistria, and Moldova as the, and this was long before the current war in Ukraine uh, and the rest. I called them outposts of empire. Um, when I was in Russia in 1996, you may remember this, Jill. There was a guy named uh, Lushkov who was the head of uh, the mayor of Moscow, and he was he he was very wanted to incorporate Crimea into Russia. That was his big uh, thing, very uh, kind of nationalist. He'd go down there and uh, and wave the nationalist flag. But he and a lot of other people wanted to keep these because they had this belief, I think, down deep that someday, somehow, the Russian empire would be restored. Now, none of them probably ever dreamed that Vladimir Putin would try to do that, uh, you know, especially beginning in 2014, especially after February 2022 and the total invasion of Ukraine. But the dream continued, and it was there all the way through the post-Soviet period from 1991 on. And those of us who lived there could see this. You could talk to people or hear about stuff, and th that dream didn't, didn't go away. Um, the idea that somehow they can manipulate this, I think that's probably right. That's what Russia did before the war in 2008. They uh, they would run drones over Georgia and they would uh, try to provoke Georgia, I think, in, in the end, uh, both in Abkhazia and particularly then in uh, Ossetia, where the war really kind of broke out, as it were. Um, it was a way to manipulate them. And last point, I guess, is that somehow this is a continuation of the old Russian imperial policy. The Russians always used to see Georgia uh, as their vacation spot, you know, still many of them still do. And they had uh, people who would come down and they built this famous military highway, which uh, you've driven on, which goes right up through the mountains through really spectacular views, but perilous driving, uh, which was their way to get the military down there to keep control of Georgia as this little kind of, anyway. so in some ways, nothing's new. It's, it's, all, uh, it's all a continuation of uh, Russian history. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, a very good question from uh, Roughly Nutsi, uh, who says, what do you see as the role of the church in Georgian politics, and how might it evolve after the current patriarch eventually leaves office? And I can just quickly add the phrase traditional values, because there's no question when I was there that the church is uh, pounding that issue of traditional values, and using it really, I would say, in not only, um, you know, as a way of criticizing the West and uh, saying that you know, their version of values is better than Europe's or the United States, but also in a political way to say, if Georgia joins the EU, it will have to abide by all sorts of rules that deal with civil society and the equality of people. And that means that you know, gay people and other minorities would have to be respected as well. So it's a very hot, traditional values are very hot um, you know, point of contention right now in Georgia. Um, Ambassador Teft, I'm sure you're, you've got some comments about that. 
it's uh what's that old saying everything old is new again uh yeah. you know i uh when i was ambassador there i got to know the patriarch quite well and that was in part because i was allowed and went numerous times to abkhazia and he had been the metropolitan of the georgian orthodox church in abkhazia before he was elected uh by the synod to be the uh, patriarch of uh, georgia and he he couldn't go to abkhazia but he he every he's i had a he said to me anytime you go i want you to come in and tell me what you see i was like source of information for him and we talked about it i also worked with him especially in the spring of 2009, there were widespread demonstrations and uh, the opposition set up tent camps right on the main uh, street, uh, Rustavelli Avenue in Tbilisi. And uh, there were divisions within the opposition then, uh, and the government didn't remove them right away. And so the city got clogged and the rest. The only person who could talk to all sides was the patriarch and me to a certain extent and some of the European ambassadors. But the opposition among in the opposition in the government there were different divisions of views and the patriarch was really the only kind of unifying presence and he tried very hard to get them to uh to stop this and to sit down and try to figure out the way forward it was in the end they abandoned the demonstrations the blockage of the road because it couldn't go ahead but even then we had within the church divisions over the future the patriarch was in favor of nato Georgia being in NATO and in the European Union, uh, but there were there was a minority of metropolitans, bishops in that church, who very much had this line that we're now seeing coming to the fore in the church about traditional values, anti-LGBTQ uh, uh, views. It was coming up even back at that time. Um, I think it's much more prominent now. I frankly don't know when when the patriarch uh, passes who will be elected the patriarch of the country and will that person whoever it is be the unifying president that Ilya II has been or will that person take a more sharp view and associate the church even more prominently with uh I'll just say divisive issues put it that way um and and again this is another one of the your, your your respondents today, uh, participants, Jill, have all have all the good questions. The problem is that the good questions, most of them, a lot of them, don't have good answers, <laughs> or at least I don't have the good answers. But it's a, it's a fundamental question because the church is uh, even with people who don't go to church uh, on a regular basis, the church is a unifying element or has been in that society, and a lot of that has to do with the current patriarch. Yeah. Well, I'll give you another question that you might not have an answer to. Uh, and that would be when I was in uh, Tbilisi, uh, especially at that security conference, um, almost invariably, any Georgian that I talked to was taking a lesson from Ukraine and saying, we are very scared. And they actually would use the word scared that Moscow will invade Georgia as well as it did in 2008. So um, I guess, you know, the question is, are they right? Should they be scared? And realistically, do you think that Moscow at this stage would try to do that again? I don't think that uh, it's it's in the cards right now. In fact, I think they have withdrawn troops from uh, Georgia because they have a big base up at a place called Java, north of Skin Valley in South Ossetia. And they've taken a lot of those guys and moved them to the Ukraine front, at least uh, so I've read. Yes. Um, it's always a possibility, and the trauma of the 2008 war is there for so many people. Uh, you can see the housing for the people who were ethnically cleansed and moved out of South Ossetia. It's just outside of Tbilisi, uh, north of the town. Uh, it's seared that society in ways that they obviously don't want to have that ever happen again. Uh, I'm not sure the Russians are able to do that right now. Um, I guess this is a moment I could say this is one of the reasons why the United States needs to continue our military support for Ukraine, because there's a lot of extras that go with that. The re Ukraine is number one, but keeping the Russians, uh, pushing the Russians back in Ukraine uh, and damaging the Russian war machine, I think, is a key one, and it will affect 
countries like Georgia and others on the periphery of uh, of, uh, of Russia and Belarus that uh, could be threatened by them. But uh, anyway, that's uh, for another uh, session, another discussion in, in greater detail. But I'll just put the plug in here. I think that's important. Another, one of the extra reasons why we need to continue to fund and provide weapons to Georgia, to uh, Ukraine. Ukraine, yes. Um, Michael, I didn't want to ignore you. Um, do, do you have a question? I've been concentrating on the... Uh, <laughs> Yes, well, I mean, I would just ask about uh, attitudes towards Russia within Georgia, which don't always fall on a kind of simplistic binary between pro-Russian or pro-Western. I mean, you alluded to the rhyming of history, right? Of, in 1804, when Georgia was incorporated into the Russian Empire, certainly orthodoxy played a, a, a role there. And we also um, just recently, uh, you know, Jill alluded to the anti-Russian graffiti. There seems to be a higher level of anti-Russian sentiment in Georgian society compared to say Kazakhstan about which we just had a conference here about Russian migrants who have had a different experience, put it that way. So uh, I just wonder what your perspective is on the divisions with in Georgian society vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Uh, that's another good question. I, and I agree with you. I, I think I always thought, and from what I understand from Jill and others who've been there recently, is that the the young people of the country really do, are even more than, say, some of the older people wanting to solidify this European connection. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. This was after the 2008 war. A uh, Georgian businessman decided to open a steakhouse in the center of uh, Tbilisi. And he signed a deal. He'd been in the States and he got a deal and got some capital from some people in Kansas City. And he flew into Georgia, Kansas City steaks. Now, suffice it to say, uh, Steak wasn't always one of the best meals in the former Soviet Union anywhere. Uh, Jill knows this. But uh, I thought, man, I got to go to this place and see. And of course, we, my wife and I ordered filet mignon. And it was excellent. And so I told the young man in Georgia, and I, he says, how do you want your steak? And I said, well, I'll have mine medium. My wife likes it medium rare. And he had no concept of medium rare. And so I then explained it, tried to explain it to him using the Russian words. And he said, I'm sorry, I don't speak Russian. So I then... There was nobody else to ask. So anyway, he says, but I think I get your idea. Anyway, comes the steak, and I have mine, which is medium, was wonderful. Mariella's was cut in half. One part was medium, and one part was rare. <laughs> now, I, I tell that story simply because, one, the kid didn't have, he was only early 20s, he didn't have any Russian. And at the time, the anger over the 2008 war was such that Nobody wanted to learn Russian. You couldn't even speak it uh, and get people would get angry for you. The graffiti that you described makes perfectly good sense to me as these people look at Ukraine and see the horrors of what the Russians have done there to the people, innocent civilians, Bucha and all of the rest of it. They don't want it to happen to their country. Now, there are others who will say, well, we've got to accommodate ourselves. To somehow to to do this somehow, hence you get this what we talked about before, balancing or whatever you want to want to want to call it. But at some point, there's got to be a strategy here. There's got to be a strategy for Georgia and its in its way ahead. Now I understand that they want to wait and see how things turn out in Ukraine. They want to see whether the United States Congress will fund more weapons for Ukraine and the Ukrainians using all their technological and other skills can use this as a way of pushing the Russians back. But I think there's going to have to be a choice here. There's going to have to be a strategic choice. Um, now, this de de depends on developments in Russia, too. And that's, uh, again, for another discussion. But I think that uh, Fundamentally, the despite everything over the last few years, the people of Georgia want to be part of the West, and especially the young people, as I've said several times. And so we need to be able to respond to that and to support the European Union and the European project in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, in fact, um, thinking about an 18-year-old, a young Georgian woman 
um, who was telling me a story that she had gone to a new cafe. There are a lot of new cafes popping up. It's kind of a hip city right now. And she thought, well, I'll check this out. So she goes to the cafe and goes into order and she speaks Georgian, of course, and she says, you know, whatever she wants to have. And the guy says, you know, I don't speak Georgian. And he's obviously speaking Russian. And she said she felt a little strange because even though she's 18, she thought, I'm in Georgia, I can't speak Georgian to order. And then she looked around and it actually was primarily, you know, Russian clientele. And there was that feeling, she said, that she felt uncomfortable. Um, and there, obviously there are some good people who are in Georgia as well, good Russians. But she felt that, um, I guess, the atmosphere that she, or the um, emotional tone that she felt was, we're here, we don't care about your rules, we're just going to do what we want. And that was, that was another kind of eye-opener to me. She speaks English and Georgian. She does not really speak Russian at all and doesn't want to. But um, Ambassador, we have like three minutes, and I know this is, you know, you're, you're a pro, so you can do this. In the last three minutes, can you give us some thoughts about U.S. policy, what it should be vis-a-vis -vis Georgia? Well, I think we've got it right now in the sense, uh, I read the statement that our ambassador, Robin Dunnigan, made about this uh, Russian law, and she opposed it for all the reasons that we've opposed it before. And she talked about the importance of civil society as part of a vibrant democracy and that the United States has stood for this throughout the 30 odd years of uh, independence after the demise of the Soviet Union. We have tried to support the Georgian people. There's been lots of political ups and downs, uh, lots of extreme people in different parts of that society. As I said before, I think we may be in one of these periods of consolidation where we'll, we don't know quite for sure how things are going to develop. Uh, but keeping Georgia on the democratic line, keeping helping Georgia, su supporting those people who want to do that, working closely with our European friends as they try to build uh, a democratic Georgia that becomes eventually a member of the European Union. I think this is all still fundamentally in our interest. And most important, it's what the people of Georgia, as the, ma the vast majority, want for their country. Uh, we need to do everything we can to support the economic development of that country. We haven't talked about it too much, but one of the big issues there has still been vast unemployment, especially in around the outside Tbilisi. And uh, none of the, the governments that I know of have been able to solve that problem. And the key, one of the keys is getting more investment in there. And that's why they're probably not turning an eye, turning a blind eye to the Chinese. But I think if Georgia becomes a true democracy or is clearly moving in that direction, you'll get more European and American investment, particularly as a transit hub, uh, as a uh, place where energy and other materials can move from Central Asia out into uh, uh, into the West. So I think the fundamentals, the things that were the basic policy when I was ambassador there a long time ago, uh, remain the same today. And I I'm, hope the, the Biden administration and whoever uh, the next administration is uh, will continue that policy. It's, uh, it's important. It's a little country, but it's an important country in so many ways that you've uh, talked about today and that uh, we've vetted. I think I've, my, my time's up. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly time. three minutes. Exactly. So. <laughs> well, I cannot thank you, Ambassador Taft, enough. This was really a great conversation. Thank you, Michael David Fox. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Georgetown University Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. And then finally, to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for, as always, is generously supporting our program. And we'll see you uh, in about a month for our next Russia Brief. Thank you very much again.